Now, my dear friends, this piece of paper that I've handed out to you, I've been saying this for 10 years. I haven't gotten anywhere in saying it, but I can go on and keep on saying it. If I could get a thousand people in the United States to understand what's on this piece of paper on both sides and go out and teach it and not go off on a thousand and one little tangents, which may be good, but very secondary, we could turn this country of ours around. And we could also turn the world around. If I could get a thousand people. I was teaching in Switzerland and I said that. The young man there, his name is Miguel Cruz. I asked him, Cruz, that's Puerto Rican, isn't it? He said, yes. I said, what does that mean, Puerto Rican? He said, that's Smith in Puerto Rican. <laughs> One of the most brilliant men I've ever taught, Mike Cruz. I told him that. I didn't see him but for a, for a year then. I was on my way back to teach in Switzerland. He came out to... Uh, Kennedy Airport, he met me and he had 79 Jewish lads, black lads, Puerto Rican lads, some Anglo lads, he'd won to Christ using that. Had a church going in Brooklyn. He graduated number two in a class of 750. Then went and got his master's degree from Columbia Teachers College. The government gave him a full ride scholarship to the PhD program. In the first year in it, three professors told him, unless you give up your Christianity, you'll not get a PhD here. You know, most of the universities in the, co in the country today, I don't think there's 10 left that you can get a PhD if you're a Christian. That's how unfair the liberals are. Let me tell you something, this man has done a great job. If I could get a thousand like Mike Cruz, now, Tony believes everything on this, so I'm not asking you to preach and teach anything Tony doesn't believe. I taught this to a fellow, and he went into a certain country. You'd all know the country, a very big, large country. He used this piece of paper, he set up a coffee house, and right across the street was a communist coffee house. He led so many of these kids in that country to Christ, and so many of them kicked a dope habit through coming to the Lord, it, it became very, very common around this capital city. So it's a nation TV. The national TV came in and made a one-hour program, 45 minutes showing him leading fellows to Christ in the coffee house, and 15 minutes of the communists across the street showing how vile and nasty they were, how they were going to kill all the Christians, going to kill anyone, and everyone that disagreed with them. There was quite a contrast in this. This thing went on TV, and it was on TV. Now, it went on first in September, and it was on, and I talked to him in February. I was there, and had been on every Monday night since, from September to February, because they'd never seen Christianity like that. And he didn't have to pay a dime for TV time, never paid a dime for production costs. All this was free. <laughs> because God stands behind this. And then, you know something? Somebody came along and gave him a book on body ministries. And he went off the beam on body ministries. Now, you never hear from him any anymore, but he's still on body ministries. Now, there is some truth in body ministries, my dear friends. Some, not much, but some. But what he did was he, he just traded in something that worked and something that was really doing great, and he went off on a tangent. I'm, I'm sad to say that. I'm sad to say that. Because that fellow, I could have recommended him recently to be the president of one of the finest colleges in this country, a Christian college. He came to me and asked me, he said, Con, would you recommend, would you get us a president? That's all happened within the past few years. Be surprised how many colleges there are that need men, understand that? And women, and women. 
Now then, we are going to look into how God rules in the inanimate creation. Now, what does inanimate mean to you? There's two, word, two meanings it can have. It can mean non-moving, but in this case, we are talking about non-living. Inanimate means non-living in this sense that we're going to talk about. There is an inanimate creation out there. By that I mean the sun, the moon, the stars, all the planets, this earth. It's non-living. And this government is over those 92 or more natural chemical elements. And if you read this, my friends, it says God in omnipotence. Wait a minute. Right there is the most, one of the most misused words in theology that there is. Omnipotence. What does that mean to you? No. That's omniscience. Nope. Oh, yes. Omnipotence means all-powerful. But wait a minute. What kind of power? There's two kinds of power in this world. What kind of power? He's got potential to do anything. <laughs> what kind of power are we talking about? Do we say omniscience or an om omnipotence means all power? Omni means all, doesn't it? Latin. There's two kinds of power. Physical power, when I do that, that's physical. Then there's moral power, power to choose between right and wrong. Moral and physical. Now then, when we look into how God governs the sun, the moon, the stars, yes, even your body and mine, so what kind of power are we talking about? Physical, that's right. Most people don't know that the, these simple definitions that we're talking about here now, now, 100 years ago, 99% of the Christians in the United States are giving them, tick those answers off like that. You should see the books that they had in the last century. And the liberals burnt them. The liberals were their first book burners. I can sure go back and show you the history of book burners. It's the liberals that started all that foolishness. So, God in omnipotence holds absolute sway over the vast realm of material creation by producing an adequate cause for every desired effect. All right? How does God govern the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth? By cause and effect. But wait a minute. Let's get back to this word now, omnipotence. I think 90% of the time when that word is used in our day, it's misused. You know, dear friends, words are tools. And if you misuse them, then it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Now, if I had a scoop shovel and a screwdriver over there in the corner, I'd say, now, I want you to go out there and unload the coal from that truck, and the tools are over there. Go over and get them. If you came with a screwdriver, you wouldn't get much done, would you? But would you believe it? That's what we're doing with words all the time in Christianity. We're doing that all the time. Then we wonder why... We don't have the effect upon the world that we should have. Now, let me give you an example here of this word, omnipotence. Two kinds of power, moral and physical. Here we're talking about physical, but almost every time that word is misused. Now, let me give you an example. I moved to Rockford, Illinois in December of 1961, after having lived in Chicago and New York City for about 25 years between the two. So I did some preaching in various churches around town, and they asked me if I would come and speak to the Ministerial Association. We have about 150 churches in our town, dead or alive. <laughs> and they asked me if I would come and lecture to the Ministerial Association. And they gave me a topic they wanted me to lecture on, and this is what it was. A layman evaluates a ministry today. That's what they wanted me to speak on. A layman evaluates a ministry today. Well, I showed up, and the head of the association said, Now, Mr. Connor, are you going to lecture on that topic I gave you? I said, Nope. He said, Why not? I said, Well, I don't want to imitate Stephen. 
<laughs> Some of them haven't read their Bible, have they? <laughs> I said, besides, the Lord has not appointed me to write the Ark of the Lord. Some of them will get that one, too. You're going to find American Christians don't read their Bible. They don't read it. You could tell them Mos Moses played third base on Jerusalem's ball team. They wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> I'm afraid many of you don't. You go out and try to do missionary work, you never even read the Bible through. And yet you can go over here to Fort Worth, Texas, find all kinds of them graduating that seminary, still haven't read the Bible. Yet to tell you they don't believe it, imagine telling somebody you don't believe something you never read. Does that make sense? So I said, no, I'm not going to speak on that subject. What I'll speak on is what really happens at Christian conversion. So I took the verse John 17, 3, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and thy son Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I showed these preachers that there's two words in the Greek for know. One is to have some understanding of a given subject or situation. The other one is to know a person by a personal acquaintance. There's two words in the German for know. Anybody here speaks German? Kennen, and what's the other one? Wissen, that's right. One is to have some understanding of a given subject or situation, knowledge, but an objective knowledge. Then the other one is to know a person by a personal experience or you know him personally. And this one, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee. That one is to know by a personal experience. Anybody here know Swedish? At least they won't admit it, they do. <laughs> Two words in the Swedish, veta shenna. Swedish Bible's better than the King James, better than the American on when they treat this word, like for instance, 1 John 2, 3. Hereby do we know, the King James says, hereby do we know that we know. Isn't that good? <laughs> the, the, King, the Swedish Bible says, hereby do we veta him, that we shenna him. Hereby do we understand that we know him personally. See it? Isn't that better? Mm -hmm. Hereby do we understand that we know him personally. Veta and shenna. If you know French, there's two words for no. Do you know Spanish? Two words for no. And I went ahead to show them about this coming to know him by personal acquaintance. What has to happen at the conversion experience? It's an experience. But you don't study your way into Christianity, and it's not a process. It takes place by having studied, but then having a climactic experience. In the Greek, the word for that is eris. Eris. So I was went into this, and by the way, I scared about half of those preachers out of five years' growth. And when I got done, I walked out to get in my car, go back to work. A fine preacher there in town, he came up to me and he said, Now, Brother Khan, don't you believe salvation's all of God? I said, Nope. He looked at me as if to say, Who let this liberal in? But then he happened to think what he heard inside, and that didn't come from any liberal. He said, you don't believe salvation is all of God? I said, no, I don't believe that. I said, of course, I was taught, like, taught that just like you were, but I don't believe that. Every seminary in the country almost teaches that if they believe in salvation at all. I said, let's see if I understand what you're saying. You're asking me, do I believe in effectual calling, that God can save anybody, anywhere, anytime in the universe that he wants to by producing a causation, and he gets the effect every time and he does it something like this, a mother prays for him, a preacher dangles him over hell for 30 minutes on Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> and by the Calvinistic irresistible grace, the poor old sinner finally wilts and gives up. Otherwise, and God can save anybody, anywhere, anytime that he chooses. Now that's what you mean, isn't it? He said, yes. I said, no, I don't believe that. I said, let me tell you why I don't believe that. God says he's not willing that any should perish. Now here I am, I'm a little one lung layman most people never heard of. I said, I'm preaching a couple hundred times a year, doing everything I can to win souls. I'm winning a precious few. Ah, but your great God, he can save anybody, anywhere, 
any time in the universe that he chooses to, but he's not. So if he can and he isn't and I'm trying and I can't, then God doesn't love sinners as much as I do. Is that right? Now you think about that. I just laid a heavy one on you there. If God can save anybody anywhere, anytime that he chooses to and he's not doing, then he is willing that some should perish. But he says many times in the scriptures, he's not willing that any should perish. So it must be that man is willing. Is that right? No, my dear friends, we're going to look into free will very deeply here in the next few days, but God never tinkers with man's will in salvation. Never. He'll influence it, but he will not cause it. So when we say God in omnipotence, now what kind of power are we talking about here? Physical. Physical, that's right. You've got to get that right. If you're going to use the word omnipotence, you must only use it in connection with physical power. Uh, you see why I'm a nut on some of these words to get them right? It causes all kinds of confusion in this world. If you don't, you got people trying to shovel coal with a screwdriver, and they don't get it done. And they wind up being a mess. So these things, my dear friends, they are very important. So we're saying here that God governs the physical universe by cause and effect. He produces a causation. He gets the effect every time. Now, my dear friends, I want you to get this word. Over this realm over which we're talking now about God governing, there is one word that characterizes this very well. It's the word certainty. You ought to write that down, certainty. Because in the realm of the inanimate, God always gets what he wants. When he starts to produce something, to do something, he always gets what he wants. But we're going to see now later about tomorrow night in the realm of free will, God very seldom gets what he wants. It's that thing that breaks his heart. He seldom, very seldom. So you're going to see the main characteristic of free will is uncertainty, and man's abuse and misuse of that great endowment of free will. So now in this realm, it's cause and effect. Now, my dear friends, I hope some of you will pardon me if, I'm, if I teach this so simply. I often wish when I was sitting in classes that some of those professors and teachers had gone slower, not go so far, so fast, and make sure that I understood what they were talking about. See, when I graduated from school, I graduated in the upper 95% of my class. <laughs> I can see you're not a bunch of math majors either. <laughs> I didn't say upper five. I said upper 95. I often say I only went to night school and the lights were bad. <laughs> now, does that help you? <laughs> if you'd like to know my war record, I was a lookout at Pearl Harbor. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to try to teach this the way I wish people had taught me, but they didn't. They didn't. Now, here's a simple example of cause and effect. We have a light here. And somewhere in this picture, there's a light switch. But I can't see it. Can you see it back there anywhere? No. Where is it? OK. Now, the light's lit. If I go to this thing and I flick this light switch down, I open the circuit, and electricity only flows through a closed circuit, so what happens to the light? Goes out. Now here's what I want to get from you. What I have just done, is that a moral action or is that a physical action? Physical. physical. Oh, my dear friends, I'm glad you got that because <laughs> let me say this. Oh, well, wait a minute. You're going to see. You think it's a laughing matter, but wait till this time tomorrow. And you're going to see that this is the real basis now of getting this country out of the mess that it's in. This is a physical event. Now, is the light doing anything right or anything wrong? No. Is the light accountable? No. Is the light responsible? No. Is the light free? No. All right, then let's see if you'll, understand, if you'll agree with this proposition. Here's the first proposition. I'm going to give you lots of them this week. That which is caused cannot be free. That which is caused cannot be free. Is that right? 
So cause has to do with a physical action. We're going to see later you never have a cause in a moral action. That which is caused cannot be free. Then we're going to see that that which is caused cannot be responsible. That which is caused cannot be accountable. All right, now, just to see, just to show you where we're going. Oh, my dear friends, you're going to see what I'm talking about here in just a moment, the importance. We have a Supreme Court justice still on the bench. He's made this statement many times in an address which he gets thousands of dollars for giving. He says, I want you to tell me now what's wrong with this. You're going to see here, the children of the Most High God can take a Supreme Court justice apart. He says this, when a man kills his wife and four children, don't blame him for what he has done. Look into what caused him to do it. What's wrong with that statement? Now, let me say this. You're going to give me some ideas now, but wait a minute after two or three days of studying, you're going to see really how terrible that statement is. But here's that 226 million people that can't take him, that can't really go to the mat with him. All right, now let's see what you say. What's wrong with this statement? Let me say it again. It's as erroneous as could be. <coughs> when a man kills his wife and four children, don't blame him for what he has done. Look into what caused him to do it. Okay? Now tell me what's wrong. Somebody had their hand up over here. Yes, sir. See, you're giving me a one-liner there. You're give you just gave me a statement. Now, that statement is right, but you didn't put it in any context, right? What you said is right. Now, you can't answer this question with a one-liner. You can't answer with a one-liner. <laughs> what's wrong with that statement? It sure does, but keep going. You just, you just scratched it. <laughs> now, everything you said was right, but it's not enough. <laughs> Would you say that again when I say it louder? Yes, of course it implies he's not free. Then how could you put him in jail if he wasn't free? He couldn't help it, right? <laughs> he's a robot. He's not a man, he's a robot. That's right. That's right. Now, quite often I have done this in a morning session like this. I've said, now, I want you to go back to your rooms and write from 50 to 500 words. Anywhere. It was 51 all right. Tell me what's wrong with that statement. And then I say to you, I want you to put your name on this. Then the last day of the week, I say, now, in the morning, I want you to go back to your room now and write what's wrong with this statement, the same statement I just made to you. And man, I get pages. <laughs> I get pages of what's wrong. By the way, do you see what's happened to our system of law now? Uh -huh. huh? That's a theological question. It's a theological problem. But people in the United States make fun of theology. hundred years ago, theology was called the queen of sciences. I think it still is. Yeah. I think it still is. Now, I heard a speaker at Youth for Christ <coughs> International Convention went on a lake. He's speaking over Moody Bible Institute Station. He said this, what the heathen needs is Christ. He doesn't need theology. Well, my friends, if you believe Jesus is the Son of God, that's theology. What he meant was, the heathen needs Christ, he didn't need his theology. <laughs> yeah, that's really what he meant. And I agree with him, he didn't need his theology. Uh, we've covered the earth with that stuff, it doesn't work. Doesn't work. Mm -mm. With his kind of theology, you take someone here in 40, you get down and holler at God and pray and holler at God and pray and to save him as if God doesn't want to save him, huh? Of course, you never have done that, have you? <laughs> 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 
Because in hollering at God like that, you're saying, come on, God, cause him to be a Christian, right? <laughs> cause him. Uh -uh, nobody yet has ever been caused to be a Christian. Never will be. that will be God becoming a respecter or what? <laughs> Why be taking away man's what? <laughs> Free will, and he's not going to do it. Paul said, oh, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient of the heavenly vision. Is that right? Sure, that's right. Which is showing he plainly could have been disobedient. Could have been. Well, my dear friends, you see a little bit now, just a little bit of the importance, the importance now of theology, just a little bit. All right, now let's take another example of cause and effect. Take that little knob, turn it to the left, the water comes out. Somebody explain it to me. That's cause and effect. By the way, you women, when you prepare a meal, you use the law of cause and effect about 200 times. When you drive a car, you use it about 30 times a minute. You're driving a car, it fades to the right, what do you do with the wheel? So you take the wheel this way, what does the car do? It comes this way. This is the cause, what's the effect? All right, if the car hits something, you're going to holler at the car? <laughs> get out and kick the tire? <laughs> yeah, people do that. <laughs> if the poor tire had a wheel, it'd gone screwy or something. Come on, explain this to me. Now there's water running all over the floor. Are you going to get standing and curse the water? <laughs> going to get mad at the water? That's very good, and that's very good. Inside the faucet, there's a little barrier, which when you close it down, um, stands in front of the water. Close it down or just close it? Well, I'm from West Virginia. We say close it down. It's all right. I'm from Indiana. We can't help it, can we? <laughs> So when he, when he turned this to the left, that released the pressure, didn't it? There was pressure. If there hadn't been pressure, nothing would come out. So the pressure is the what? Cause. And the, uh, the releasing of the pressure and the pressure is the cause. The effect is it runs all over the floor. Now, I want one more example. You remember this one from your high school chemistry? <laughs> what is it? What are those two? Bunsen burner and a... A beaker, or as they say in, India, in England, a flask. <laughs> flask, that's right. All right, now, we have water in this, and we get this thing lit and burning. What happens? Now, you tell me. See, everybody in this room knows what's going to happen. All right? Now, explain it to me. Well, uh, you sure went from first to third through the pitcher's box. <laughs> now, what you said is right. What you said is right. But someone explain a little better. Yeah, that's true. Um, some of it, not quite all of it. Uh, when we put the heat in the water at a certain altitude, at a certain temperature, it's going to what? Boil. Nine times out of ten? Every time, when it's that simple, an illustration. When it's that simple. Now, there's such a thing called the law of indeterminacy, the Heisenberg principle, which is at a subatomic level, and I don't think we want to get at that here. Which is saying that some, there are some things when we got about 30 variables, 
or maybe a hundred variables in which we don't know the value of each one of them. We may do something that'll happen six billion times in a row, and a six billionth and one time it won't. It won't. But you see, that's at a subatomic level, and we are not talking about in moral government about that. So we must see here that that water, when the temp when the Bunsen burner puts heat in it and puts enough heat in it and gets it at a certain temperature, it's going to boil. And if you don't put a retort to come bring it back in there, it's just going to evaporate, right? You lose it. Now then, is the water free? Is the water accountable? No. Is the water responsible? No. Can the water have any guilt? No. By the way, what do you think that Supreme Court justice was trying to do with that man's guilt? You see, he tries to even relieve him of his guilt, but he can't do it because that's built in. God's made man, so when we do what is wrong, we get a guilt complex. So we'll have enough sense to stop doing what's wrong. Even a dumb dog won't kiss a hot stove twice. <laughs> <laughs> and all these people running around going to shrinks to pay them $70 an hour, oh, I've got this guilt. Sure you got the guilt. You know why? Because you're guilty. <laughs> if you go to your preacher, he'll tell you for nothing. <laughs> and if he's a good preacher, he knows how to get the guilt resolved. I have a good one. Not one out of a thousand can do it. And the way you can get a guilt resolved is get a man to Calvary. If you really understand superego and psychology, that's Freud's word for conscience. And only the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse the conscience. Not only cleanse from sin, but cleanse away guilt. I'd like to find a Christian psychologist sometime that knew enough about the atonement so he could really get people delivered from guilt. All they can do is explain it away. It's like a jawbreaker in your mouth. You've still got it. <laughs> still got it. Now, I want you to give me an example in everyday life of cause and effect in your life before we go ahead. Freud said, man's biggest problem is guilt. I agree. That's the only thing I ever agreed with Freud on. From there, we part company. Man's biggest problem, yep, it's guilt. But it's because he's guilty, not because he was too harshly potty trained. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think you got green eyes because your mother was scared by a pool table either. <laughs> All right, I want you to now give me an example in your everyday life of you using the law of cause and effect. Well, explain that to us. That's right. That's a good example. Put the key in the ignition, turn it, and it uh, connects an electrical circuit. Closes it. Closes it. And uh, juice from the battery goes to the starter, okay. begins to turn the crankshaft, pistons begin to go up and down. Is that right? Yeah. And then the little gas vapor goes in there and a spark comes in and it's gone, right? It's a good one. Somebody else. Wonderful. Does the car have any choice? <laughs> You're probably driving one of those Hitler's revenges. <laughs> Someone else. Come on, I want you. You've got to get, if you can't get this, you never go ahead and you'll never learn any theology. It'll mount to anything. If you can't really get this, what we're talking about. Now, you women, when you prepare a meal, you use it so many times. You go over to a stove and you go like this. What are you doing? You either turn on the electricity, you turn on the gas. Is that right? You do this, you know something's going to happen. If it's gas, you'll, maybe you've got a pilot light that lit. Lit, you can turn up the amount, turn down, and you know what you're going to get. Is that right? Mm -hmm. If you leave it on there too long, what's it going to do to the food? Or if it's too hot, now you're going to stand there and curse the eggs because you burn them. <laughs> you shouldn't. Shouldn't. <laughs> now, give me an example in your everyday life. If you let go of your pen, it will hit the floor. That's right. That's a very good one. 
It's a very good one. Someone else. Put your hand in a sink of water, it gets wet. That's right. Very good. Very good. It's very good. Someone else. Pushing open the door, the door opens. That's right. By the way, I'll just show you, everybody's body obeys a law of cause and effect. Now let's say I could bring anyone up here out of this audience. Have you put out your hand, blindfold your bare hand, then if we could get some backslider with a cigarette lighter <laughs> and get it lit. And while this bare hand's out here, we'll just take this thing out in here like this, see? What do you think he'll do when he gets here? He'll say, well, I perceive a rise in temperature. <laughs> What do they get to do? You'll even find out what the word involuntary means. <laughs> Your body obeys the law of cause and effect. Now, I don't know everything about women. I know very little about women. But I know this. If you women don't eat for three days, I know what sensation you're going to have. What is it? Hunger. That's right. That's the effect. What was the cause? You see, my dear friends, that's all engineering, that's all science, that's all chemistry, physics is, is studying the various laws of cause and effect. And we learn that when we produce this causation, we get that effect. But there's no right, there's no wrong in this. And there's no, nothing moral in this. Now I'm going to show you that when we get into man's behavior now, they're saying, oh, he's like this because he was raised in the ghetto. Oh, he's like this because uh, a mama spanked him too many times when he's a kid. Or he's a thief because of that bad boy that lived beside him. <laughs> oh, no. Nobody's going to stand in front of God and say, God, I stole because I couldn't help it. Because <laughs> I was raised around a bunch of thieves. Oh, no, 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 no. Mm -mm. We will show you that so, uh, so plainly from the Word of God. It's just like this. When a man gets drunk and he goes out and gets in a wreck and kills a woman and four children, you think it's going to be sufficient to stand in front of God and say, God, I was drunk, I couldn't help it? No, no, no. God will hold him accountable for the antecedent choice of having drank too much and throwing away control of his faculties. Nobody will stand in front of God and give excuses for the things he's done like that because he was drunk. No, it won't work. And if I was a judge, it wouldn't work in front of me. Wouldn't work in front of me. Wouldn't make a bit of difference. Of course, they'd probably call me a hanging judge. A hundred years ago, you did any of this monkey doodles they're doing now, boy. You got yourself a front seat in a crossbar hotel. <laughs> That's why it was one of the greatest countries in the world then. But now we all this foolishness has hit jurisprudence. And here sets the old church back, just letting them do it. Just, just doing this. <laughs> without feeling, without thinking, and without being a force out there. Say, oh, no, no, no. And by the way, I hope you kids will read my book. I really deal with these things in four Trojan horses. Let me give you one example. One, just one example. The town where I live, about six years ago, a fine lad named... Joey Didier disappeared about 5 o'clock in the morning, January, cold, dark morning. Was never seen again alive. Three weeks later, they found him hanging in a Boy Scout camp from a rafter, stark naked, been abused to death by a homosexual sodomite truck driver. Abused to death. Well, our police department did some wonderful detective work and they arrested this man and he confessed. He'd done it. When it came time for the trial, he asked for a change of venue. That means to change it from this circuit court to another. And he said, I can't get a fair trial here. What do you mean fair? The guy confessed he's guilty. I would have never given him a change of venue, he would. But it was transferred 120 miles away to Rock Island County, Illinois. Came out in a trial that 10 years before, he'd done the same thing, almost the same thing, to a 10-year-old boy. Been given one of those ridiculous sentences of something like 399 and a half years, you know. But he'd been turned loose after six years. After six years. So they put that shrink 
the prison psychiatrist on the stand said, now why did you turn him loose? Now, I want to see if you folks can tell me what's wrong with this. I hope you can after no more than what I've taught you this morning. He said, why did you turn this man loose six years ago, or after six years when he was given that long sentence? He said, I thought he was cured. What's wrong with that statement? Well, that's the stupidest statement that's going to be made. What's wrong with it? That's right, young lady. He made sin out to be a sickness. That's what the whole court system is doing because the church is sitting back doing this. Not thinking. Not thinking. Not really getting out there in the world and thinking. Not getting out there in the college campuses and being there. I'm going to show some of you kids how my daughter, Faithy, who was with Agape Force here. She went through your training. Boy, when she got back on college campuses, many, and she was on the sweetest, most gentle. Some of you kids here on the staff know her. Boy, I'm telling you, when she got back, and she's a very gentle, she's very quiet, but when she sits in a class, you couldn't give her a pile of horseradish <laughs> for truth. You really couldn't. And uh, she, thank God she became bold after coming here. Now, bold's great if you know something. <laughs> but if you don't, you're better off without it. <laughs> Let me give you an example. She sat in a, in a college class, and this professor gave this old turkey of a lecture. It's been around since 1890. You can put man in a test tube and predict what he'll do. He lectured for an hour and a half. He said, now, st students, are there any comments? And my daughter, Faithy, raised her hand. Now, mind you, she's a very gentle, she's a very timid, she's a very shy, a very sweet girl. Takes after her mother. <laughs> but boy, has she got her up here and here. She stood up and she said, Professor, you are not properly differentiating between an influence and a causation. And you seem to have never have heard of the incipiency of the human will. <laughs> he said, you're right, I haven't. <laughs> well, she said, first, I must explain to you the difference between a causation and an influence. Now, an influence, you can say no to, you can say yes to. A good influence, many a preacher's kids have been raised around a good influence, said no. Is that right? Many have said yes. You read my book, I show you at one time, 100 of our biggest corporations 60 of the presidents are 100 biggest corporations were preacher's kids, so don't think they all go bad. She has 60 in the United States. That's in my book in case you learn to read this while I'm here. <laughs> I think you can get it at your bookstore down here. If you can't, I got a few with me. And by the way, I'd be glad to send you one. I'd have my secretary call you. If you're willing to read them, I'd send you one free for nothing. Would you read it? Yes. She went for 10 minutes. She said, ah. He stood up and he said, Miss Khan, do you know anything more on that subject? She said, I sure do. <laughs> he said, would you please stand up and give it to us? She got up and gave him 20 minutes of moral government. She sat down, he stood up, he said, children and young folks, I stand corrected. Miss Khan is right, I am wrong. You cannot put man in a test tube and predict what he'll do because of the freedom of man's will. Yes. Now that's what I call having the coons chase the dogs. <laughs> And if we don't get a bunch of young people out here, out in this world today that know this kind of stuff, this country is doomed. Amen. We're dying for a lack of knowledge. That's what we're doing. We're like Israel in Hosea 4.8, and in Israel and in Isaiah 5.13, God says, my people are perishing for a lack of knowledge. And he could say that today about the Church of Jesus Christ in the United States. Look at all you people saying, oh, the devil made me do it. Oh, we got so much superstition in Christianity, sometimes I don't want anything to do with it. I used to be chairman of the board of deacons in one of the finest churches in the city of Chicago. I'm over visiting the pastor one night, and his wife said to me, Oh, Brother Harry, the devil was chasing me around his house seven hours today. <laughs> seven hours. I said, My dear sister, you must be the most important woman in the whole cockeyed world. She said, Why do you say that? Well, I said, he doesn't have anything to do but chase you. 
Now, the devil is not omniscient. He's not omnipotent. He's not omnipresent. He can only be in one place at one time. He can't even read your mind, and all he's got to do is chase you. <laughs> what a spiritual pride that is. That's spiritual pride. That's bragging when you talk like that. By the way, I don't think Satan has ever spent two minutes on me. You know why? I've never been important enough. So don't go around talking like the devil made me do it. The world will write you off and you ought to be in a funny farm. Even they know better than that. You get what I'm saying? Look at the superstition. I want to say it again. The devil's not omniscient. He's not omnipotent. He's not omnipresent. He can't even read your mind. This is why a lot of men don't pray out loud sometimes when they're in a very, very important thing. He can hear. <laughs> he can hear. I hope you begin to see some of the importance of some of these things that we're talking about here. So, this is cause and effect. And we find in the scriptures that God used a lot of that. Now please turn in your Bibles, if you will, to 119th Psalm. The 90th and 91st verses, I want you to read that. The 119th Psalm, you see, all of this obeys physical laws. As I said to you, that's all chemistry, engineering, physics, obeying certain physical laws. Now we're going to see where these physical laws come from. 119 Psalm, the 90th and 91st verses. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine what? Ordinances. What's an ordinance? It's a law. What kind of a law here? Physical law. Physical law. They continue this day according to thine physical laws, for all are thy servants. Now, we got two kinds of law in the Bible, moral law and physical law. We're going to have sessions this week on moral law. Moral law, but the whole physical universe obeys physical laws. The young lady down here gave us one. She said the law of gravity. That's a physical law. All right? Now, my friends, all science is based upon phenomenology. Now, that simply means she dropped a pencil, hit the ground. She made an observation. Now, you can observe certain things happening, and you observe that that phenomena happens like that all the time, every time. You can formulate a physical law. You can do it yourself by simply observing. Now, how do we sense them? Right there. We can see it. We can touch it. We can taste, we can hear, and we can smell. Now, I want you to tell me, here's a phenomenon, I want you to tell me how this is being sensed. Somebody back there, tell me. Well, with you, it was sight. What, what, what do you think it was with me? Well, wait a minute. I can see it. Is that right? I can feel it. And I can hear it. Now, my dear friends, here's the point I want to get across. You've got to get this. Science is limited by the senses. Science cannot go beyond the senses. Science has boundaries beyond which it cannot go. Sociology, psychology, political science have no right to call themselves sciences. Because you cannot put the human will in a test tube. You can't see it, can you? You can't feel it, you can't hear it, so on and so forth. Just like electricity, you can't see it, you can see manifestations of it. We're going to see. And a lot of things in this world being called science are not sciences at all. It's about time the churches tell them they're not sciences. I really mean that. Tell them they're not sciences. A lot of people call themselves scientists today that are not scientists. 
Now, they may make a scientific appraisal of something, but that doesn't mean it's a science. Now, tonight, we're really, or I mean tomorrow. See, I'm used to going in the mornings and evenings. You people would have uh, spiritual indigestion if you had four hours of this day. So, all science is limited by the senses, by phenomenology. All right? Please notice that. Science has boundaries. Somebody tell, what are the boundaries? What are? Someone tell me. You know. That's right. What did you say? No. The senses. The senses are the boundaries of science. All right. Now, let's see if you'll agree with these. We'll wrap this up. That which is caused cannot be free. That which is caused cannot be accountable. And that which is caused cannot be responsible. But by the way, that which is caused cannot be found to be what? That's right. <laughs> cannot be found to be guilty. That which is caused. Now, we are going to see tonight that that which is free cannot be caused or it's not free. <laughs> you get that? We're going to see that that which is free is accountable. And that which is free is responsible. And that which is free can become guilty when it does what is wrong. So don't put a moral creature in the same test tube with something that is inanimate. You get that? And one of the biggest things wrong today in our world is we are using words interchangeably that are not to be interchangeable in any way, shape, or form. Now, uh, let me give you an example. I was in prayer meeting a few years ago in our Sunday school superintendent, godly man, stood up and he asked this question. He said, why can you raise kids, carry them to church from a baby, deny yourself for them, do everything you can for them. When they get 21 years old of age, they go right out and throw it away. Now, what caused him to throw it away? What caused him to throw it away? So the pastor said, Harry, do you want to take this one? <laughs> I played baseball with guys like that. I got it, you take it. Well, I said, I have to explain a, a theological concept before I can do that. And I explained the incipiency of the will. And when I finished, the pastor said, yes, we have a terrible thing. We live in a Freudian age when something moral happens. We say, what caused him to do it? So what have we done? We've used a physical word instead of a word having to do with moral action, haven't we? And we wonder why we got such confusion and why we can't help our kids and why the professors can drive a wedge between the parents and the students. Let me tell you something. No professor could ever do that to my kids. Uh-uh. But if you're going to sit around, drink beer, and watch TV, and watch the cowboys all the time, the professors will eat your kids alive. But if you use that head of yours for something other than to keep your spinal cord from unraveling, <laughs> you can keep your kids. You can keep your kids, but you got to teach them. And if you're gonna, kids are like dogs. If you're going to teach a dog, you've got to know more than the dog. <laughs> and only 6% of the Americans ever read a book a year. Did you know that? We're dying of ignorance. And when they do buy uh, a book, they buy something like My Life with Bogey. <laughs> oh, for goodness sakes, such trash. Such trash. When are we going to learn that the mind's like a computer? You put garbage in, you get garbage out. Yeah. By the way, let that be a lesson to some of you people go around buying these bubblegum religion books, too. Yeah, bubblegum religion. That's what we call them. Just having to do with experience. They don't teach you anything. Leave them alone. They hurt you. They don't help you. Any book that doesn't enlighten you is hurting you. Oh, you can create lots of things. You can design something today you didn't have yesterday. Uh, God did not create sin. We did. Of course, you're right. God.
God never created sin. Oh, I should say not. Oh, don't lay that one on him. You're right, brother. And I wish a lot of people more could see that. Now, so much for the inanimate. So in our next session tonight, we're going to start end it. And we're, tonight, we're going to thoroughly cover. By the way, would you like to come back tonight? Yeah. Well, how about that? Brother Ed? They'd like to come back tonight. Seven o'clock. Okay. Okay. All right.